Ori is from Canada and Britain and the world, really. Now, Clements, <laughs> you, you're proud of not moving very far. Um, in, in order to look at the world, but Rory moves quite, you know, travels to quite a few places to to see the world. But you, you well, I wouldn't say proud. I say well, <laughs> I've, I've accepted it now. So, well, um, you know, we, we're talking about what makes a good life, and I think my life would have been considerably uh, richer and better had I travelled more. But through circumstances and um, well, I guess. What's the word? Trägheit in English. Inertia? Um, sort of inertia, oh, yes, just, absolutely. Just, uh, or laziness, I don't, I don't know, or, or, or fear, whatever. I didn't travel that much. I'm quite the opposite of a travel writer. And if I can look at something on Google Earth, I, I will. Mm. But not all, it's not always a good um, um, replacement for the real experience. Yeah. Whereas Rory, I mean, you, you were born in Graz. Rory was born in Vancouver but you've mm -hmm. pretty much moved all your life, haven't you? Yes, yes. Well, maybe perhaps Clements is happier with what he has or more content with what he, what he has at, uh, at, an, at home. Um, I'm always curious what's over the, the next horizon. Perhaps envious, that's a bit strong, but always curious what's over the ne next horizon. I want to see that and I want to then compare it to what I'm familiar with and also bring back um, and uh, bring back my experiences, what lies over the horizon, bring that back to the readership. Now, um, I've known Rory a very long time. In fact, what, what brought us together, so to speak, is the fall of the Berlin Wall. And um, so 30 years ago, as you know, if you've been following all that. And uh, I've always been, in, I've read every single one of Rory's books, and I think there are 14 now. Um, and um, do I get prize? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <coughs> I, what I've really admired about you, Rory, is your continuous search for, and you're, you're, tr you're indefatigable. Each country, each new country, you go for something that we haven't seen before, some kind of constellation of something, of the stars that we haven't noticed before. And I wonder, you know, beyond the fact that you have to earn a living and that you like traveling, what it is that drives you when you visit North Korea, um, and, and Cyprus and Crete and all these different places. What is it that you're trying to find? Well, I suppose it's curiosity, which I mentioned all, already, and, and a, a, a wish to understand and a, a wish also to refine, if, uh, to refine oneself by understanding how other people in other parts of the world, how they they live, how they cope with the, the pressures, the challenges, the joys that, that we all face. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, Europe in turmoil and your um, latest book, which um, you'll be talking about today, which is, just came out like a week ago, I think. Indeed. Um, Pravda, <clears throat> ha ha. Um, it's about truth. And I think pretty much what Clements writes about is truth. Um, Clemens, you've actually read Rory's book yeah, as I've, well. Uh, I've only uh, gotten it like five days ago and I've started, but yes. yeah, I've enjoyed the... And I, was, I got curious as I skipped ahead to the Berlin section and to the Transnistria because I wanted to go to a Transnistria. Transnistria. wanted to go oh. once there <laughs> and I couldn't or I just did, it didn't... Did the, um, the, 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 the travel group that we wanted to... Uh, it, it kind of dissolved and then it... Yeah, I, I forgot about it, but I want to go some... some Someday I'd like to go there. We can talk about Transnistria. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah let's do an article. So this is going to be interesting. <laughs> this is sort of a thing for... Um, <laughs> it, it, I'm, it's, a, it's, it's weird because I don't, I don't know anyone except you now who has been there, but everyone I know knows about it from the internet. So it's yeah. like a meme. It's like a, a thing that's sort of cool on blogs and so on. More than... Real, sort of real famous travel destinations who also share that that blog existence, but that Transnistria. I don't don't think people. Maybe the most extreme example would be the the Chernobyl exclusion zone, and I know people who have been there actually, like my <laughs> friend Christian Kracht, um, who has also never been to Transnistria, and he has been <laughs> all over the world. So, uh, yeah, but Transnistria. Did, did did you? Well, you write in the in the in the book that he didn't know it at, the f at first. But um, when you heard when you heard about it, did you did you say, I have to go there, or 
<laughs> so that was the first. Yes, yes, I, I <laughs> heard about it a few years ago. Transnistria, yeah. it's a Transnistria. It's a breakaway republic of a breakaway republic of the old Soviet Union. For those of you who don't know, it's on the Dniester River, and it's on the western side of the river. And uh, uh, Stalin had incorporated when his the Red Army moved moved west. He incorporated. <laughs> Transnistria, part of Moldova, into the Soviet Union, into the Moldovan Soci Socialist Republic. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, this, this small piece of, um, of, of former Moldova declared independence. But basically it was driven to declare independence by a, a number of oligarchs and for the former KGB officers, and it's not recognized by any country in the world. No, it is an extraordinary place. Now, Cle Clemens, um, if we call Rory a traveller and a travel writer and a filmmaker as well, <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll talk about David Bowie later, because he worked with David Bowie. Um, Clemens, how would you describe yourself? I've seen so many descriptions. I've seen magician, well, mathematician, uh, translator. Yes, yeah. yes that's Did you correct, study yeah. mathematics? I did, yeah. yeah. But I, I'm not a magician. You're I'm not, not a magician. stage magician. I don't know what the... I, I sort of, maybe I'm known to... Magician of words? Of words. Magician yes. of words. Well, that's both <laughs> yeah, of you, then. Um, that's another thing you have in common. Yeah. And then, um, but definitely short story writer, um, novelist, poet as well. Yeah, and, and I'm on the internet a lot. <laughs> and, you're on the inter and you're on the internet. You Google Well, a lot. because I, I just thought that um, uh, Transnistria, so um, it's a country that hasn't been recognized, and I've just... Um, did a lot of research about micronations, um, about you know um, areas or even sometimes houses, literal houses that have declared independence or that have, that have been declared an independent state and then going to legal battles and and whatever. And that's just decades long wars with with authorities. These these, these crazy sort of um, stories about encapsulation. And that's because I'm writing a book about um, constructed languages and people who write books and poetry and, and literature in them, especially the poetry in like Esperanto or Folapuk. And, Have and you heard of Europanto? Europanto? Yes, that's another one I can yeah, throw into. Um, Diego yeah, Marani, who is an uh -huh. Italian writer, also writes in Europanto. I think so. I've, I've, yes. I've, 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 um, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, sure we can all contribute to yeah. this book <laughs> in some way. Yes, I, I, yes I, I think if I could contribute, because when I was about 14, I, as Rosie said, um, I grew up in Canada. We had a, a, a small island. My, my, it, it's such a funny story. My father had, bought, was, had been quite wealthy. He lost all his money. And he had to sell all the properties. And uh, in Canada, um, islands and, and, uh, and plots of land are sold by number when they're in the countryside. And some bureaucrat wrote down all the numbers. This is pre-computers. And he forgot to write down one of the numbers. And, it was an, and so we were left, the family was were left with an island about the size of this stage. In a, in a Georgian Bay, part of a, a Lake Huron, uh, in one, the Great Lakes of Canada. And so this was my island. And oh. so I declared independence. Yeah. I called it the Republic of Bumpalump. Oh. And, um, I was 14, and, uh, and my father was the king. Uh, yeah. My mother was the queen. But of course, it was, a, it was a, democ a Republican democracy as well. So I didn't quite have worked that out at the time. And I even wrote to Ottawa and said, uh, by the way, we, this is now an independent. And what language uh, did you speak on this island? Uh, French and uh, English. Yes, very Canadian. Yeah, yes, very Canadian. Did, did um, you get an answer? No. Oh. <laughs> Return to sender. But it was quite nice because it said uh, it, it had to be returned to the Republic of Bumplump, so it was stamped officially <laughs> by the post office. So I took that as official recognition yeah, that Bumplump so. existed and still exists. Yeah. We're still stuck with this island. You know, you well, we've got a little island here too. Mm. And it's all ours. Um, yeah, so I, it's a literary the, island. The, the, those, these kinds of stories, like, they're, to me, like endlessly fascinating because, unlike your story, they sometimes have real-life consequences, like 30 years after it, and, and it destroys lives, or it, it makes people insanely rich. Or it, it, and the, the greatest story is about the, the, the language and the micronation of Talosa, which was founded... Talosa? Talosa, yeah, by a man in Milwaukee. Uh, it's called, I think Robert Madison, and he declared his childhood bedroom a micronation. Actually, I think 
it is disputed, but I think he's the first person who used the word micronation. Yeah. Not, maybe not the concept, but he used the word. And he invented a sort of, um, f uh, yeah, l a little bit like Esperanto, so sort of um, pr uh, Romance language called Talosa. It looks like a little bit like a fantasy Provençal, something like that. <laughs> and uh, he, and this was before the internet, and he, he, he this became like, like a, a game, and then it, it spread on, on his, to his f family and his friends, and they were all learning Talosa. He invented it. It was kind of funny because the kid was very, very gifted, actually, or apparently, and um, people liked it. And then he made a, a website and said, well, if you want to become a member of my Talosa, sort of tongue-in-cheek, and hundreds of people came, and they sort of, the, in, the, in the next years, they took over. They were like sort of, sort of online citizens, and they, uh, they were saying, these people in Milwaukee, these these real life Talossans, do they exist, or are they just a conspiracy theory to control us? Are they like sort of a governing, uh, um, what's the word, uh, <coughs> archetype or something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is absolutely amazing, though, isn't it? I mean, this is actually people who want to create alternative <coughs> lives. Do you remember the um, Second Life? Second Life, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it was, you know, this is what people, this is what we all want to do, is to create, I mean, maybe this is the, the topic as well, <laughs> you know, create a, a different life, a good life. Of yeah, our I was own. never on Second Life, but it was sort of before social media, right? It was, it was before social media, or yeah. Twitter and Facebook really took off, I think. But now um, everyone is... Second life. I don't and know. Now everybody has a second life. Yeah, maybe. Well, look, let's let's talk. To, um, uh, you know, introduce people who may not know your your stories, um, because it does. Um, <coughs> Sorry. Do you want some more water? Okay. Yeah, it's something in my throat. Um, and yeah. it's. I, I mean, this discussion leads wonderfully oh, into what you do, Clements, because not only are your titles of all your books and your stories absolutely fantastic, like Suns and Planets. Amazing title. The frequencies, and I've translated them into English for the sake of this. My son's written with an O. Yes, Zuna. Zuna. Sons. Sons. Zuna. Um, and the frequencies, and love in the time of the Malstadt, which a Malstadt child, which won the Leipzig Book Prize. And you've just for this, but there are lots of books and lots of stories, and there's one in English, Indigo which was published That's in one. 2014 in English, um, which is fantastic. Out of print, long. <laughs> it's <laughs> amazing, long time, yeah. amazing book. And I wish more of your um, books and stories were translated. But um, maybe with this one. Now, this is uh, Der Trost, Der Trost Runde Dinger, which is absolutely extraordinary. And I, it says uh, here on the back, absurd, grotesque um, human life. So you're... According to the book flap, you're looking for the absurd and the grotesque in human lives. Uh, there are 20 stories, and you do exactly that over 20 stories. Yeah, but, but I also look at a um, little bit what it says on the title that tells the comfort of... Um, what does it mean? Yeah, well, the, it's... So, uh, the, so the comfort of round objects. Round, round things, yeah. Round things. It's... Um, um, well, it's it's uh, taken from a story the where someone is trying to comfort himself during a panic attack, which he, he suffers from panic attacks and it's controlling his whole life. And but he he sort of makes these mental uh, lists of of things that that are that are nice and things that that he should avoid, and things that are nicer, round things like round uh, fruits and so on. But um, I'm interested in. Um, this is such a banal thing to say, but I'm really interested in, in the, the private lives of people because I think uh, protagonists in literature sometimes behave as if they had no private life, if, as if they were the, like the private, like the detectives of the, the, the story that the author has invented. They don't go to the toilet. They don't. They, they, they don't have parents. They yeah, don't they, just, and sometimes they even don't, they don't even eat. have a job. job. They don't, they don't eat. eat. Yeah, and and they don't. They don't have completely irrational moments throughout the day. Sometimes that's sort of intentionally put in, and you say uh, using like pyrotechnics of, of modern prose like Joyce, Ulysses, and so on. But just the uh, the everydayness of total perversity in thought and and, and what you're doing, as far as I can tell, is you're actually watching people when they do, when they think they're not being watched. Yeah, I think that's a good. 
and, formula, yeah. And that's I actually, so. that's really fascinating to me because that's the moment when we all think we are really ourselves. Um, so that that's really what you do, I think. Yeah, probably. Um, I like I like that. Yeah. So, uh, for for example, there's one one story about a woman who um, has a uh, she she cares for a child with a severe uh, head trauma, and he's in a uh, I think it's a waking coma or a catatonic. Yes. I don't know what the word is. Um, a pallic state, or whatever. Maybe that's the word. I think his English is better than mine, so I really <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I don't know what that German, means. Apalish, I'm not sure, but <laughs> it's uh, yeah, sort of. Um, and uh, but she she um, invites a um, a male prostitute, and she wants to have sex yes. with with him, and sort of maybe in front of the in front of the kid. Maybe that's that's hinted at, and and if you if you just hear that that synopsis of the story you say okay that's some kind of transgressive whatever like sort of like shock so shocking but i'm really interested in in her private thoughts how she how she came to that 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 would be a great comfort and that would be a great like almost like a magic trick let's let's try and try to do that and because I, it all, it all yeah. seems real i mean that's yeah. the interesting thing you start actually with a real scenario real people these are real people yeah, and people like that exist and i'm one of those people i mean i, I have the most ex extraordinary strange thoughts i have violent urges i have i have revenge fantasies which I, which don't don't play any role in my in my outer life or, or or like like affection for random people sometimes i want to protect people that i've never met before and, and have and what is that that is something that's you know that's the domain of literature to, yeah, absolutely. to look at. And you know, sometimes I, I miss that in novels because people are sitting around, behaving themselves, talking, getting the story going, and having a, an adventure. <laughs> and it's sort of, but I, That's I, why they're so brilliant. I, you know, you know, um, yeah. I think it's the right time to hear um, at least a good chunk of one of the stories. Can um, I, may I interrupt though, Judge? I just want to yeah. say what, what you've been saying. It reminds me of this wonderful line by Cis Notabum, and he says, We are all condemned to live in this single body. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's absolutely. And that, I think, is the, uh, yes. <laughs> that's what mm -hmm. drives me to want to go to the far horizon because, because I want to see how other people live in their bodies. I want to m imagine other people in their bodies. And but it's it becomes, very, very once you have that instinct and that drive, it becomes addictive, hmm. don't you think? It becomes because you always, there's, there's always another place, another person, another, another idea to investigate. Is that what drives you both as well? This, you know, it, it is addictive. Once you've achieved that kind of insight, I can't imagine you now writing a so-called normal story. Well, like, something maybe I, I, I do. I, I don't. I never think. A, a normal that. romance between. But maybe for money, I know. <laughs> maybe I should do it. Maybe, maybe my uh, my publisher would applaud that decision. I'm not sure. um, I think both your publishers are pretty happy, actually. So I don't think you need to worry about that. But it, it, sure. yeah. it's so. It's so. Yes, I think it is addictive, because I find it so enriching. I find there is quite a powerful debate going on at the moment, as we all know about, between. Uh, cultural appropriation, what's the cultural? Uh, appropriation. Appropriation. Which, uh, which you spoke about yesterday, yes, actually. Which, yes, it, which suggests that, you know, I as a male cannot write about a woman, or I as a Brit or a Canadian can't write about a German, or I as a Scorpio can't write about a Sagittarius. <laughs> and I, that strikes me as ridiculous, mm. because yeah, it's, it's I have this imagination, I'm stuck in this one body, yeah. but I have this imagination, and I want to know what it feels like to be a, a, a Burmese worker in under the generals in 1967. I want to know what that feels like. So yeah, I think it's also quite quite sad to say that you cannot ever be, that you cannot know something that's not you. That would, that's really sad. I mean, so that you're just surrounded by a discontinuum. I think I think I don't know much about him, but I think the philosopher Georges Bataille he said that sort of there's an absolute discontinuum which can only be sort of um, uh, Bridge, bridged, connected, or, or, connected, or, or, or um, yeah, bridged, bridged, yeah, bridged by sexuality. Or that, or that, uh, yeah. Ah, over, over. But I think that's sad. I mean, you can do it by other means. I mean, you don't have to have sex all the time to not feel surrounded by a chasm. 
mm. and this is this is a very sad story. Mm. And also, I um, sex I, sex can't obliterate the, yeah, no. the the feeling of emptiness and. Well, it can probably, but it's not the only thing. <laughs> I, that was a probably, question mark, sure. by the way. It was <laughs> not a <laughs> statement of fact. Yeah. It doesn't last long enough, though. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's just sex. A... Where am I now? Sex doesn't last long enough. Okay. No. Right. Well, let, let's let's get back to hearing um, hearing one of these stories because um, both Rory and Clements have got readings um, for you. And so, Clements, if you'd I'm be okay. kind enough to start, if that uh, if that works with everyone with the translation. That's wonderful. So, yeah. um, so it's one of the stories. It's at least it's about five minutes of one of the stories, and yeah, it's just the beginning, and I'll okay. Sort of so we've got the try and find English up here, clip. and Ross Benjamin, in fact, translated Indigo as well for you. Yes, that was he, your, he, he's, he's your novel brilliant. in English. He's wonderful. Like. Yes, absolutely. I would be very honoured if he did it again. <laughs> well, let's try and make it happen. So das uh, das Schulfoto, the class picture. Über den Hof der Eduard Osbig Volksschule, vorbei an der großen weißen Vogelstatue, ging ein kleiner Mann. Roy? Die tiefstehende Abendsonne warf seinen Schatten voraus, eine längliche Feuerteufelkarikatur seines Körpers. Den Regenschirm hielt der Mann wie einen Strauß Blumen vor sich. Als er sich dem Schulgebäude näherte und den Kopf hob, trat die Direktorin einen Schritt vom Fenster zurück. Sie hatte sich, da es nun an den Abenden schon etwas kälter wurde, aber die Heizung im Gebäude noch nicht in Betrieb war, ihre Jacke angezogen. Heute Morgen hatte es, als sie mit dem Rad zur Arbeit gefahren war, schon herbstlich gerochen, erdenschwer nach Eicheln und Laub, aber alle Blätter hingen noch an den Bäumen und der Fahrtwind war warm. Eine Fabrik war vor ein paar Tagen abgebrannt, es gab großräumige Verkehrsumleitungen und Venus und Mars waren in Konjunktion getreten. Es ist natürlich in Ordnung, wenn Ihnen das Bild nicht gefällt, aber fast alle Eltern haben das Foto abbestellt, nachdem sie es gesehen haben. Dabei wussten sie doch, dass der Daniel in dem Bild sein würde. Ja, natürlich, sagt der Preis nach. So, dann ende ich jetzt hier. Schade, dass man nicht das Ganze hören kann. Aber ihr könnt das Buch auch kaufen. You can buy the book outside. Uh, yeah, it's going to a very wild place. This and, it, <laughs> and it goes into a very, very strange direction. But it's I think you know what's the <laughs> I, know, I know what happens in the end. Um, but this extraordinary collection of um, stories has just won the, the Berlin Literature Prize. Um, I'm shortlisted for the Austrian Book Prize, so it is really, really special. Um, there is one story, before I pass on to Rory as well, to hear his read, there's one story which I think you should tell, which is about, because it's got a Canadian connection. It's about a flight oh, to yes. Canada that yeah. doesn't happen. Yeah, um, that should have happened. In and a way. should have happened. Yeah, I was invited to Canada and oh, could, so it was you go. in the story. Yeah, it's sort you. Of, yeah, <laughs> sort of, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you were just and, about and to travel. I was actually, yeah, and I, I was invited together with Norbert Strein, who actually won the yes. Austrian Oh, prize. so you, you didn't? He you beat did, me. Yes, yeah. he beat you. So are you still friends? Are you still? Friends? I don't know him at all. Oh. He, he didn't come to the prize uh, to the announcement. Right. So whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I was Robert invited. Robert Stein won the, the Austin yeah, Book Prize. But I, I haven't read the book, but um, it's probably great. Yes. Um, yeah. But um, how generous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I you know, but I thought um, uh, I was once invited to to um, what was it to uh, Banff. Mm. Uh, Banff. Yeah, the so in, in the Canada. In the mountains. Yeah, Rocky very mountains. Right, yeah. And I was excited to go, but then I got sick. I had a, a strange thing with my eyes. A which turned out to be a sort of a chronic um, autoimmune problem, which now is uh, it's very gone. luckily gone, gone completely. Yeah, and but I was very worried and I couldn't mm. couldn't go. Yeah. So and the story, but the story arose then out of yeah, the fact that you yeah. couldn't take the flight. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Actually, it's, not, it's uh, quite a uh, well, not a running gag, but a, 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 like a light motif in my <laughs> life. Flights I couldn't <laughs> go on for some reason. <laughs> Actually, I have never missed a flight, like sort of speeding in a taxi, to, but actually, they, they, for other reasons, just whatever, mm. just people getting sick, catastrophes, things getting cancelled, I've, I've had that a lot, <laughs> I don't know why. I, I, uh, I also missed a flight that changed my life. Um, I was changing planes in Bangkok, and this is before everything was totally computerized. And I ran to a plane which I thought was connecting, connecting to Thailand, and it was actually to uh, Rangoon, Yangon, in oh. Burma, in Myanmar. And that's how I ended up in Burma for the first time. So just the, by the mistake, little got on the plane. But I was very tired after the 11-hour flight from London. And uh, 
and then plane took off and I realized I was going to Burma, which is where <laughs> I'm not supposed to go. And, but then that eventually led to a book, uh, an so obsession, a, a passion for the country, a so desire to understand the country, the nature of the Burmese people. So those were the days where they did let you on without checking? or did it, it was, I was running from the flight, I'd just come off the London flight and so they saw it and I just, mm. they ran oh. through and it, it was when tickets were handwritten, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> Which takes long us back to ago. a long time ago <laughs> when you started. When you started it's interesting when technology or culture mm -hmm. changes and adventures like these just get non-existent. Yeah, yeah, I don't think yeah. that anyone could probably in some, I don't know, but, but very hard, I yes. imagine, yeah. It's true though. I mean, yeah. travel has become, has changed so much. But also, I mean, that is, thank you for that perfect link into, into this book because uh, when you wrote your first big success, Stalin's Nose, it was a very different world. Mm -hmm. um, so Stalin's Nose, which was um, Rory's first, first book, um, in, published in 1992. Mm -hmm. So it was a journey that you made um, after the Berlin Wall fell, mm -hmm. and uh, Rory can tell you a little bit more about it, but just to bring it up to date, so 14 books later, this is number 14, and this is looking back over the 30 years across Europe. So starting in, instead of starting in Berlin, which you did with Stalin's Nose, you start in Russia and work your way backwards. Mm -hmm. And the fascinating thing for me, looking at Stalin's Nose, which is quite surreal, there's a pig in it, there's a trabant, there's an aunt. Um, surreal, there we are. There is another connection. Um, that, that was full of euphoria. It was full of the joys of a newly liberated Europe. The walls had fallen down. And here we are, you've written a book about truth, mm -hmm. or <clears throat> more precisely about the lack of truth. Mm -hmm. Pravda. Pravda. Ha ha. ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us about that journey, Rory, and um, about this book, because this is a very, you have for all of us reinvented the travel book. And I know that some of your greatest fans, like um, John Le Carre, and um, Robert McFarlane and Jan Morris, they, they understand what you're doing. Tell us about your journey, if you like. Well, shall I, may I read this? Really? Yes, because it, it, read it, that first, and so then this, we'll, we'll talk more about it. Rather sets it up. So this is, um, <laughs> this is um, Moscow. This is yeah. Moscow not so long ago. And uh, mushrooms as yes. well. Not the smell of mushrooms, but <laughs> mushrooms. But hal mushrooms also cre create hal um, hallucinations, mm. don't they? So maybe that's another connection. So... Uh, <laughs> So the reading's about four or five minutes. Did she just, told let me just check yeah. that the German is coming. How are we doing with the... No German? Okay. Okay. Fine, you all understand English. It's Apologies fine. for the English. Mm. She told you about mushrooms, said Dmitri Denisovich, with a swift intake of breath. I want to taste the mushroom, I told him again. Russia's chicken czar fixed his hooded blue eyes on me. He leaned forward in his graphite office chair. I held his gaze. He obviously hadn't expected my request. Beyond his panoramic window, a jet black helicopter climbed into the cloudless summer sky. The Kremlin's teeth took a bite out of the firmament. No problem, he said with forced nonchalance, not breaking the stare. His vowels were dark, his voice as thick as tar. One million dollars, he added, twisting the diamond ring on his finger. I could hear the cogs whirring and crunching in his brain. Or one book. Dmitri Denisovich meant business. But now tolerance, empathy, and even the promise of the future were under attack. I had to find a way to keep faith in them, despite the echo of marching boots, and the shadow of Brexit, and the collapse of a European dream. You come to my dacha Saturday, said Dimitri, more used to issuing orders than invitations. It will be trip you never forget. Bravo. I feel really, really sad hearing that. I mean, it's, it sounds like despair. At the beginning of the trip, yes, I think that's probably right. 
when I began the trip because it, 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 the optimism that that perhaps unreali unrealistic optimism of 1980, 1990, 1991, 92, um, that had I, I was swept up by that, I was part of that euphoria. I, I believe this was the beginning of um, this, it was a, the start of a, a new age. And it hasn't come to that, I think, be, to a large extent because of the, um, the over-optimism of, uh, of many, especially in, in Central and Eastern Europe. I think to, uh, not to divert too far into politics, but, but I, I think that uh, many Hungarians hope to be as wealthy as Austrians within a year or two. Uh, I think many Poles expect it to be as, as rich as, as Germans within a couple of years. And of course that didn't happen. And then one adds in the um, uh, 2008 financial crash and the, the devastation that that caused. And uh, certain individuals who, who wanted to take advantage of the, the emotional state of many of their people. Because when the Poles, the Hungarians, and Czechs, and Slovaks weren't, <laughs> weren't as wealthy, weren't as, didn't feel themselves to be as free, as wealthy as the French, or the Brits, or the Swiss within a couple of years, I think many of them started to look back and started to romanticize. Maybe we have, of course, nostalgia in Eastern, in Eastern Germany. And, and I think that nostalgia was manipulated by people who wanted to take power. I mean, you start in Russia, um, and it looks, uh, and it is politically um, for you, where everything, where, where all this started to go wrong. Um, this is, you base that story that this lack of truth, the fact that the Russians learned to live with a fiction, mm -hmm. um, it, it all starts there. So, I mean, tell us about this, this notion of truth and what you discovered about, particularly about the Russians um, and how you, th how you feel they're living today. And then you can tell us about Putin's pecker. <laughs> <laughs> You see, now, if you understand English, you know you know about you know what pecker means. We'll tell you. I wonder how it's being translated by our wonderful translators. <laughs> Big letters. Um, so truth. Truth. Uh, this fascinates me, as I think it it fascinates me both. I I, I became. I'm, I'm going to look at my notes because uh, <laughs> my memory is not the, the finest. I I think um, I think we are all susceptible to stories. And I think an individual who spins a good story can win many, many followers. Um, and if that is done in an immoral way, um, amoral. amoral way, then it, those people who are following the story, who are attracted to the story, um, can be manipulated, can be uh, encouraged to follow the Pied Piper, if you like. For, for me, the historical record has never been complete because history has always generally been written by the victors and the record is never complete. And so the gaps between the facts have always had to be filled in. And they've been, in filling them in, a narrative has been created. And that narrative has been directed by the storyteller, quite often the people in power. And, uh, and it, it, it is, which means that every, <laughs> every history we've ever been told, um, every personal history we tell ourselves is a story, is a narrative, and so has elements of truth, but it is not completely true, because I don't think there is such thing. And that, that subjectivity has been manipulated, and, and I think is being, oof, it, it's been, a, it's been a glue to hold countries together. The, so the, li lies, I think that's one of your phrases, mm. lies are the glue that yeah. hold countries together. Well, we have the myth of the American dream that any boy can become president. We have the myth of the United Kingdom, that little island, this little island standing up against the world. We have the old Russian myth, which has now been restored, which is we're surrounded by enemies. We have to protect ourselves. And, and these myths are very useful domestically because they 
bring a people together, but and it's they're Putin, not. Putin to get to Putin's pecker. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I can I, I see that book as you know it's a subtitle Putin's Pecker, mm. um, because a lot of a lot of this is about Putin. A lot of it is about Vladimir. And there's Vladimir there's a Putin, there's a yes. truffle, a mushroom. <laughs> that is that the is mushroom the shape. that I wanted to taste. Yes, <laughs> it is the shape of Putin's Pecker. Um, you know what Pecker is? Penis. Yeah, and Putin, as you know, is a strong man. Everything he does is brilliant. I'm sure he has a fantastic pecker. I, I have no doubt. I have, have no, no direct doubt. experience but it is, of this. It is the shape of a, 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 apparently this mushroom was in the shape of um, Putin's pecker. So it's called Putin's pecker. But, um, but so so yeah. what I wanted to do, because I tell the story of this remarkable mushroom, and going with Dmitry Denisovich, the Russian chicken czar, we go and we discover this uh, remarkable mushroom um, together. But what I wanted to do with that story and many of the other stories, which I think is when we come quite, one of the many places where our work comes quite close together, is to, is to provoke. Mm -hmm. Is I want to put out a story which will, which will encourage the reader, the audience, to say, that's remarkable, is that true? And the way the book is constructed, then I hope the reader will then start to reflect on certain other stories, myths that we are told. So you're always keeping people wondering. I mean, that is one of your hallmarks that um, you, you write factual travel stories, but there's always that unknown factor of the fiction because you do um, fictionalize a lot. I use and fictional devices. Fictional devices. And for ages in, in Britain, that's what people talked about. They, that's all they talked about when they spoke about Rory McLean was the fact that he, you know, he used fictionalized facts or fact, mm -hmm. fact anyway. Um, and uh, and, and it, spring, it springs from this, the subjectivity of the individual experience because the three of us and all of you will have totally different memories about this hour we're spending together. And, and if we were to write it down, you would have uh, 110 different views. Mm. And, and that fascinates me. And so that, so that makes me question objective truth. And then when especially politicians or people uh, aspiring for power want to put a, uh, come up with a story to get followers, I'm very suspicious. That is not the truth. No. It is a truth. But this um, idea of truth. I mean, you're talking about storytelling and you know, creating these stories, and you're both storytellers um, in that very basic, basic but I important way. This idea of trying to find a truth, um, it's, it's impossible, isn't it? Well, I, I just now, uh, I, I thought about a, one of my favorite quotations from Fernando Pessoa. I can't um, can't remember the exact. It. No, no, I don't remember the exact, but it's something like um, for a person who wants to promote um, more truth and earnestness in, in the world, it is, it, is, it is only logical that he or she start at them, themselves. Starts at, with themselves. Yes, yes. It, it, this sounds totally banal, but mm. if, if you take it, if you really look at how, how much, for example, I'm, I'm a pathological liar. <laughs> I am, I really am. Well, so I used to be, <laughs> well, I used to be, well, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not advocating that at all. I, I have a, Is this in your fiction or in your no, life? No, in my life, really. And <laughs> I've, I've caused... You're in your fiction. <laughs> Hopefully not in your life. <laughs> I do my best. Who knows? No, I, I've caused massive, uh, well, um, damage to people's lives with that. And, and now I'm trying to do the, exi the exact opposite. And boy, is, is that hard. This is... What, being this, good? Well, be, being, saying the truth, telling the mm -hmm. truth. And not, not telling what you think is appropriate, and this is it's, it's insanely hard. Mm. And yeah, you can have these truisms of Binsenweisheit, as we call them. So, so these truisms. Truisms, truisms. truisms, yeah. So let me look at it and say, okay, this is a nice inspirational quote, whatever. But that happens to be very difficult, and almost um, you almost have to um, become a different creature. You know, it's it's uh, it's very painful. Uh, I have to leave everything behind I wa that I've been. So, um, <laughs> well, truth, yeah, truth. Th this can be quite, quite, uh, quite a challenge. And I think to, to go somewhere else and see the lies mm. might be even easier than to see your own. 
Probably. I mean, does it bother you? I mean, this world that Rory is describing mm. and um, the, the era of fake news that we mm. live in, because I think that's another really interesting um, uh, set of descriptions you give to modern Europe. I mean, we've gone through, in the th last 30 years, we've gone through the collapse of communism, um, the collapse of capitalism in its, in its, in its, uh, in its original, fo original form, um, and we're now in an era of the collapse of truth, as you call it, the disintegration of truth. So that's the headline for how we live now. I mean, it's pretty hard, hard times. It's not a good life. Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure if, if you... I don't think one... Well, I'm going to kind of say it in a very strict way, probably. I don't think one even has the right to say that it's not a good life. I mean, we're, we're alive, so we, actually, we have one uh, against all the other lives that have never even... that never even have been a possibility. Because the the start begin what's the word the Anfangsbedingungen um, the the initial um, um, you know, circumstances don't yes. have, ha, have haven't even come up in the universe so no I would never say that I have a bad life I have created bad situations and I mean uh, th th this is <laughs> are you <laughs> if writing it's pondering about it, this is terrible are you writing about I mean, you're not writing about good people. Oh, I would say I do, yes. I, 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 I don't, uh, uh, well, you You're writing about people. Yeah, but I mean... Uh, Normal people. You, you know, um, Imre Kertes, he survived the uh, Auschwitz and, um, and other um, oppressive um, uh, re regimes and so on. But, and he, he says that he has never encountered, even in the camps, a bad person. Mm -hmm. Now, what does he mean by that? I mean, this is quite a... It sounds provocative, but um, he, in, a, in an interview, said that it is... Uh, they were they were only doing good by the most extreme means that they thought mm. you know, so good in their way um, it was good to get rid of Jewish people in their worldview and uh, and he he was able to see that i mean so sort of, i, I don 't know how you how you can be you have such a large soul to do that i don 't certainly don 't have that large a soul as he had i mean this he 's one of the yeah, I, I don't know that how, how you can feel that. I mean, you probably can repeat it if you read it, even if you have had these terrible experiences, but to, to feel that and come up with it, mm. this is beyond me. And, and I very much um, consider him a hero for having that, um, having that sentiment. Mm. <laughs> the, big, yeah. the big soul, yeah. as you uh, call it. Yeah. It's a, it's, uh, I think that's uh, it's such a vague term, soul, but I, 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 think, uh, uh, I, I think probably... Mm, that's something that's underemphasized when you're talking about learning to write. That you have to have, you, you have to sort of, yes, you have to. I really would, would, would state it like that. You have to cultivate that what used to be called a soul, sort of a feeling for um, the, the things you cannot change in the world, but living among these things and and structures and principles and laws and so on. Well, you, yeah. I know Rory teaches writing as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it is about, um, as it, it is about with, with the way you write, of course, you're structuring very, very ca carefully and cleverly these stories that even if they do go off into flights of fancy and imagination and so on, they are so cleverly structured. So there's always, um, there's always a framework would you say even to? I mean, you, you, you look at look at this, the, the absurd nature of these stories. Nevertheless, there's a there's a mind behind them, um, driving the story, the narrative. What do you have? A, do you have? A, is, is there a vision in that? Me? Or yeah, so both sorry. of you. Oh, uh, if I do, if I re revise and. and uh, is, if there is a vision, vision. To, oh. to what you're trying to do with your story. Well, I, I also have taught writing for the first time for a very short time in Berlin uh, a few months ago. And I was, uh, I was surprised how <laughs> easy it actually is if you have talented people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's just. Yeah. Delightful. You, have, you don't have to do that much. You just have to encourage. You have to have an yeah. idea of how to no, do it. No, no, no. no, no. no you just, no. just s <laughs> let yourself be swept up by their, by their thing. And I mean, I had the, 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 the privilege of, of getting lots of uh, 
ein Einsendung, Bewerbung, was sowas. You, uh, you get lots of um, um, commissions. And yes, yes, and I, I could choose. You can choose. Yeah. You can pick so and, I chose, pick and choose. chose the, the students um, who I thought. Oh, sorry, you got submissions. Submissions, for yeah. I, I, I got lots of. Um, uh, f f I, I could choose and, and, and you know, only work with those who, whom I really considered quite uh, uh, talented. And so that, that became very easy and I thought, I, I don't have to do that much. I just, I just generated in the classroom a, 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 an atmosphere of, uh, of appreciation and of, of uh, well, I imagine, sort of, uh, of, of, sort of egging them on to be more um, uh, what's the word? Stur. Um, <laughs> Narrow stu headed? Um, uh, stubborn. Stubborn, but yes. But it's more stubborn, than that. It's focused. Yeah, focused, focused and, and stubborn. And, mm. and just mm. forget more and more what other people think. So I, by telling them what I think, I probably, I hope I help them to not listen to that. <laughs> yeah. You want so too many little Clements said yeah, I was I was the ladder that they had to smash. <laughs> That's, it. That's very revolutionary. <laughs> um, I agree with Clemens. I, I think I'm not suggesting that everyone has a novel within them, but uh, but if you touch the right part of an individual, they can draw uh, draw out of themselves um, a story, an aspect of their one and only life. Um, I've I've. I do, I'm not as I'm not as selective as you in the uh, in the people I teach. They sort of come, all of them, and um, and what I encourage them to do is to find the the memory, the quest, the obsession that's in them. And of course, we all have something, something that really matters, something we so care about. And then just give them the tools to uh, to draw to to build it. That's all. It, it seems, and the tools right. can be taught by just allowing someone or telling them it's okay to steal and to imitate. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's yeah, that's the secret. Yes, yes. I think that's the secret. Yeah. How to write? You know, the, uh, just steal and imitate, mm. and then change it a little bit. Then make it your, <laughs> but then make it your own. <laughs> make you it know, your own. Follow, follow someone. It, yeah. Because if you, you know, yeah. if you're, I don't know, it's Kurt Vonnegut mm. or uh, Gunter Grass, if you love their work, then read it all. And, and, and of course, when you start to write, you'll be writing like Gunter Grass, well, mm. sort of. But, uh, but then, and he will, he will have appealed to you for a certain reason. He will touch something in you. And then I think your voice will eventually come out of that. And it is, again, it's about empathy. It's a word that we've been using the last couple of days. It, uh, maybe that's more than soul. Maybe the word is empathy. Um, you're appealing to something that people, if, if you like, makes people feel better, but also makes them recognize themselves. Is that, is that a good description? Yes, too. I, I had um, some of the discussion yesterday on empathy I had difficulty with. Of course, my experience is very individual, very privileged, I would say. A white Western male, um, that's a very privileged uh, existence. But empathy for me has nothing to do with power, nothing to do with superiority. It is a meeting an equal and trying to understand that person equally and, and through that understanding having empathy for them. Are you trying to do good with your writing? Trying to do Good. I'm trying to understand. I'm curious. I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to be a conduit. The reason I, I, the reason I ask that very specifically is because you help a, 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 refugee, a refugee in this book. There's, there's a, a, a man called Sami, mm -hmm. and you help him escape mm -hmm. from his, his back, and you help him escape um, through. And you know, and he says to you at one point, "You're a good man." And I think. You know, is that what you're trying to do? Is your tr of, if, uh, of course, I try within myself, um, and I suppose yes. In in all my work, <laughs> I want to bring an understanding. I want to bring a positive reflection. I want to portray li the richness of life, even the dark side, in a in a positive to wa way. To see the the, the goodness and, and and empathy for me is central to that. How do you feel about that? What are you trying to do with your writing? It's not just for you. Hmm. I, no, it's not. No, I, I, uh, even in my, in, when I'm writing in my diary, I th always think of someone reading it for some reason. But it's 
yeah, constructed that no one <laughs> will read it probably. But, um, you hope. Maybe. Uh, I always uh, hope nobody will read my diary, but I read it thinking, okay, I hope this is well written. Maybe I hope this is one, <laughs> one self in the future. So one, you know, one, one. But um, uh, I thought of, um, just now thought of Susan Sontag, who always hated the word empathy. And I never could understand, qu could quite understand why. She, she was um, suspicious of the, the concept of just empathy and that being the virtue and not being uh, not, not having a sort of uh, a structure around it i think because sometimes empathy makes you uh helpless in a way i used to have that when i was quite ill i had as i mentioned autoimmune issues which also make you know change your brain chemistry completely and uh, you get very depressed and the empathy or the yeah, the mitleid, the mitleid, and the well, it's the, the English word the same. Sort of, you have w used to disarm. Or, what's the word? So completely. Um, I was paralyzed by it. That was it. Yeah, and that's not good for anyone. That's just a, 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 a like an internal opera of, of suffering, and you also do a lot of bad, real bad, evil stuff when you have that kind of empathy. Um, I mean, I'm just. To get the point across, I can make a very, very exaggerated point. Maybe you, you have um, empathy for animals, and you go into a slaughterhouse, and then you kill everyone there. You know that would be. You, you could say, you could argue that this was guided by by empathy, but not empathy for the workers there, of course. Yeah. So by prioritizing <laughs> certain things, yeah, but different kinds of empathy for different um, beings and different things. Our culture provides that, a hierarchy of empathy. If you have empathy for um, inanimate objects more than, <laughs> than, than living things, then people will say, well, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I agree. But, then there are, but if, you say, if you look at people, other categories of people that you don't have em as much empathy with, I'm probably sure everyone has those, but it's a little bit taboo to think about it, a little bit taboo to, taboo to discuss it. And of course, you, you, you shouldn't. You okay. should have an, an all, all encom. What's the word? An all encompass. All encompassing. All encompassing. Hard, hard to pronounce. Amazing all English. <laughs> it's just an wow. All <laughs> Thank you. An all encompassing. Obviously, been reading yeah. far too much James Joyce. But <laughs> oh, uh, uh, listening to podcasts. I think that's that's what. <laughs> podcasts. Everybody podcasts, listens yes. to podcasts mm -hmm. now. Yeah. yeah, it's true. Um, so I mean, just to, to round up. Um, a little bit to listening to both of you. Um, you're both very much bound up personally with what you write. Um, I mean, you are what you write to a certain, even though these yeah. are fictional stories from what you've been telling us, and you are what you write to. And your, hand, your, your heart is very much on your sleeve in this book, I think, where you come to almost like, um, you know, it's almost a missionary. Um, zeal a, and a kind of campaigning end to the story where you talk about Brexit and what's happening in Britain, mm -hmm. about the breakdown of that um, dream of 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I felt very much, um, I thought, I don't know about many of you, but at the moment, you know, we live in, in difficult times. Mm -hmm. And I think if we don't put our um, you know, put our hearts on our sleeves if we don't sort of try to change something now. What are we here for? Um, is that a fair enough assessment of where you are at at the moment, Rory? Well, the, uh, as, as you will know from, uh, from what I read and from, uh, from the travel writing genre, it's, it's written in the first person. It's written in I. And um, it's... And the traveller the narrator in the book, that's, my all, that's part of me. It's a part of me. It's a proxy. It's, um, it's if you like, my alter ego. And, and he, he travels um, to see what's over the horizon, as I, I said before, to learn about other societies, to try to understand them, to empathize with those uh, other societies. But there's... Um, there's, there's another aspect there. The I, and this relates directly to your question, the I, the, the I am not saying, look at me, the writer. 
I am saying, look with me. I'm not saying, look at me. Aren't I clever? I've been to Moscow. I've been Berlin, to Berlin, uh, to, to, Berlin uh, to, to Burma. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, look with me. So look through me at something which is so much larger and more interesting than me. And that, that's, that's very central to me. So even though it's written in first person, I try not to be there to an extent. I, Rory, try not to be there. Mm, and you, uh, and you, yes, no, you do. I, I, I want to be, if you like, uh, I think I used the word before, a conduit, uh, a bridge between what I see and the reader. And in, in a way, I try to be invisible, but <laughs> with some opinion there. <laughs> You're not invisible. No, not you yet. You don't try no. to be. <laughs> no, no, not are, you, are, you trying, are you trying to change something? Is there a mission for you? Well, I, it, it would be nice to think, uh, to think that, that I could really have a large-scale change, but probably um, I should not count on that, and I should not um, get caught up in, the, um, in empathy for, f for things that I cannot ever have. What about truth, though? Because, I mean, if you look at the... You know, Rory's um, been travelling. If you look at countries like Austria and Britain and so mm -hmm. on, too, which have not confronted, as countries, not confronted their own truths. I mean, we have okay. a big, I mean, in fact, that's what Priya Basel was talking about yesterday, the fact that we have not confronted our colonial truths, our, mm -hmm. um, we're just beginning to confront what happened with the Windrush generation. I mean, it's, 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 it's for countries, mm -hmm. it's important to confront that. Do you feel that Yes, well, if you have helping? the, yeah, if I get the, if, if you give me the, mi the microphone, then I will say something, then I will, I'll take the, the opportunity, but probably I'm... I'm, I'm giving you the microphone. You yeah. have the <laughs> microphone. Yeah, uh, well, I'm chained, chained to one. <laughs> it's like sort of the, the braces for, for necks. <laughs> this is, this is the Madonna one. headset. Oh, it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can no. sing. We can sing yeah. afterwards well, if you want. Just like a virgin. <laughs> a, a revolutionary song I think okay. we need after all this. Well, but I, yeah, I, I try to, to, to comment on political issues. I'm not very fast at doing that. I try to get up to speed by being on Twitter all the time. <laughs> uh, that, I don't know if that helps, but um, I, I try to do that, yes. Um, there are people who are very, very gifted, like Michael Kölmeier in, in, in um, Austria, or Julia Rabinovic, and so they, they can write very fast, and Menasse, I don't know. But I'm not that fast. You, know, you have to be fast. You have to understand the picture and then mm -hmm. come up with something. I'm not that good at it, but I, of course you, I would be ashamed if I didn't try it. Sure, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing it. Uh, but I also noticed some uh, a, a tendency among my, my peers, um, and my, my, I'm not sure if you should say generation, but among writers, to, to feel good when you have just said something. You know, just, just, just say, this is the cause of yeah. A, B, C, whatever, and then because you get praise, you feel good, mm. and you you actually think you have done something, but you ha you haven't actually. You just so I I think writing isn't isn't the the best tool to really have large scale change in the world. Small scale might be yeah, it might be a good thing. For example, if you tell stories about how people let's say deceive each other, you might be l more truthful in your immediate surroundings with your your family, your friends, and that might have a huge change in the lives of those people, but not a global, not a countrywide change so i I, th I think it's more it's more that yeah that might sound like a cop out a little bit, but I believe it very passionately actually no it doesn't yeah. sound like a cop out <laughs> none, none of this this has been i think you'll agree the most extraordinary conversation. And I think that what I love particularly about these conversations is that um, they themselves become, um, if you like, a search, a pursuit for some kind of truth. I can't bear it when we don't, when we just follow the same path and the same kind of um, structures for events. So I think it's really fantastic what's come out of this conversation. And I can't thank you both enough for that. Um, and before I sort of round up, though, I do want to make a shout out to the translators um, yes. because somewhere there are 
two amazing interpreters translating, and um, they've, been, they've been with us for a couple of days, and also the translations that we get on the screens as well. We haven't named all of them, but it's really important that we recognize the importance of translation, and as a translator, you know that. As linguists, we know that our, ourselves as well. But um, both Rory and Clements will um, very happily sign books. Rory's brought a few books from, um, from Britain, but you can also order them as well. It's just come out in English. Hasn't yet been translated into German, but if there's a publisher out there, I'm sure Rory <laughs> would be happy to talk to them. Um, so please join me in thanking Rory McLean and Clement said thank you very, very much to both of you. Thank you. Thank you.